It's November the 2nd, 2015. I'm Dana Drimford, also known as the Nuclear Proctologist.org. And you can find my videos in Fukushima presentations of Beautiful Girl by Dana on YouTube. So today we're going to cover the Temple University, Japan's campus. And we're going to cover SafeCast. And SafeCast was your last line of defense where they were going to keep an eye on the radiation throughout Japan as a citizen network and that they have been quoted and by m just so many journalists and so many medias and so many people on just Twitter and Facebook and what we find out now four and a half years later is that everything is unreliable and that they have lost all their credibility because of just, you know, the infiltration of the nuclear industry itself, I guess, is a better way of looking at it. But I'm going to start off today, not on that one. <laughs> supposed to be this one. Yeah, this one here. And better yet, this one right here. And so what I'm going to show you today, to start off this whole, this whole, um, five-part series is something that you probably can't comprehend until I show it to you so I'm going to show it to you as soon as my computer and so we're using a laptop because number nine computer has been taken down in the last year and a half don't talk about Japan and because of that I can't even see hang on I'll find what I'm looking for but because of that I can't even see I do this the hard way. Gotta do this the hard way, I guess. Hang on. So this is a chart where we covered 260 days of the coastline of Canada. And we went all the way up to Alaska coastline. And we went into Dundas Island. We worked our way down the west coast of Canada. Every line you see there, we've done and done in between it and done many times. And like um, Langara Island, most northwesterly point in Canada, we done that. We spent five days there, and that's at the nuclear proctologist. All of these pictures, except for the stuff in green, and the top part of the island is up on the website. We're still getting all the green put up on the website. And so we've covered fifteen thousand miles of the coastline, and we have, and we have. Uh, documentation of what it looked like before and before when you went anywhere and now this is uh, Louise Island in particular and I'm going to show you before and after pictures before we get started today this is before picture and this is what uh, how healthy the animal life looked There's some staggering pictures there uh, so the sea urchins would be right out of the water the red Pacific sea urchin and there's 600 algaes in these tidal pools but this would be a typical picture of anywhere the coastline of British Columbia, Canada. And we'll come back to that in a second. Now this is the same spot, Louise Narrows. Coming up here. This is Louise Narrows. And that's one of those watch boys when you first come into it. I'm looking back at it. I'm looking uh, south with that camera view. Now that's the same spot I was just showing you pictures from pre-Fukushima. And now you see that there's no life on the shoreline except for a little bit of mussels up higher and there's an amazing amount of tide flows through there and just for context just for context that's located out here that's on the back of that island right there you see that arrow well well you see arrow skiddy gate below skiddy gate I'm not sure if you can see the cursor on this particular desktop presenter because my regular computer is not working so we're, we're improvising but it's in the Queen Charlotte's, which is isolated from the uh, 26,000 islands of Canada. Um, and so, let me keep going here, because then we're going to jump right into uh, just a disturbing day anyway. And so this is what's left, but this is what it looked like pre-Fukushima. And so this is the same spot, Louise Narrows. This is a really good example of low tides. 
And so the, all the tidal zones would look like that. Now they look like this. Now they're completely gone. Everything is missing. Now this place up here in particular was coveted. And people from all over the planet had went here. Every, you know, year after year after year to see that, you know, to see all that life that used to be there. This is pre-Fukushima. It was just a thriving 600 algae, 78 species of sea anemones, 76 species of starfish, the flanas, the floras. You had all the sponges, 70 species of sponges, the 480 species of worms. You had all the shellfish, the mollusks. You had the periwinkles. You had the whelks. You had the clams and the mussels and, and the scallops and the abalones and, and oysters and razorback clams. And it was just this incredible diversity. But there's over 4 million species in the Pacific Ocean. And, and they were the indigenous species to British Columbia, Canada. And now, of course, you see there's nothing left there. But before, it was very stunning. No matter where you went, it was very fragile-looking environment pre-Fukushima. This was just a beautiful area of nothing but life. And even the sand was covered in the leatherback uh, sea stars. And that's not my zodiac up there. We got a cabin and we're orange. But you can see what the typical shoreline would look like at the low tide. And if you look at, and these are very uh, low tides. This is like a two foot tide up there. This is a two foot tide and there's nothing. There's maybe at best four species. And that's a stretch. None of them are healthy. And that's a bit of muscles you've seen up there. It's hard to say, I, I would imagine on your end of the screen. But that's little tiny muscles. But everything there, see how low the tide is? That's the high tide line up there. Way up there is the high tide line. And so there's literally nothing left there. And that's, an, a, that's a, a typical picture of that area because you, you see that on both ends of that particular entrance to the back of those channels, right? Because you're, you're on the back of that island below Eero. And you're in that little nook where the, because it's not a high quality uh, screen capture you're looking at there. But anyway, you get the logistics of it, right? That's uh, all the spots we've covered on the expedition for life. And we'll finish up on this in about another minute. And so everywhere you went, it was just this magnificent, healthy environment. You can see the China snails. You can see the leatherbacks. You can see the algae. You can see all the green. Now, this is a picture that still haunts me to today. And this is what it should look like everywhere. This is what, like I spent 14 years as a commercial diver, six hours a day in the Pacific Ocean for a majority of it. 100 day trips back to back. And I also worked the Atlantic Ocean year after year, winter after winter. And and so I understand this environment, but this is what I'm used to seeing in the ocean. This is on the shorelines and at the low tide zones, two feet underwater. And just the whole shoreline itself at super low tides. This is what I said, what I would expect to see everywhere. But instead, everywhere I went is this. And this is because of the radioactive fallout from Japan's melted reactors. That's why this is all missing. Because this coastline is kept warm by the warm waters from Japan. It's a direct path over here. But the jet streams are real. And so it's shocking to see all of that is gone. It's just frightening. And so many people went there every year just to see this environment. This was something, I only seen a sea urchin out of the water two different times in 260 days and 15,000 miles of coastline on the Fukushima expeditions for life. So like Ken Buesler in one sense, just a tiny sense, because Ken didn't do what I done. I showed you the truth. Now, Ken Buesler and Temple University are not going to show you uh, the reactors, say, for instance. And so let's just go in right quick and, and have a quick boo at the reactor so everybody's on the same page. That there's four melted reactors, 100% meltdowns in Japan. This is reactor one. They're putting a Kevlar sarcophagus around it with cranes, robotic controlled cranes, uh, in order to direct the emissions in one sense up the stacks so the homeless um so the homeless are uh, can last longer because you won't see uh as the as b brown or ken Busler at fukushima even though they're in japan 
You won't see these people <laughs> at the reactor. They know better. This is unit two, it's a 100% meltdown, melt through, melt out. And like Ken is not gonna show you that and uh, the speakers are not gonna show you that. So I need to show you that before the video starts. We're about to start. This is unit three. And if you need me to explain that to you, I can't help you and nobody else can. And this is unit four. And if you need someone to explain that to you, I can't help you. And most likely there is no help. There is no medical procedure that could help you. If you think that they're reasonable or that there's something left inside of them, um, there's nothing I can say to you to help you, okay? You are living in this world that is not normal. And that's why they don't show you the pictures because they know that if you see the pictures, you'll be like, there goes that theory and they're leaking. What do you mean already leaking? Of course they're leaking. How can you ever stop it? You can't stop Chernobyl. The only reason you got a sarcophagus over Chernobyl after 10 days was because the chain reaction rather stopped after 10 days. But that's why they can't put a permanent sarcophagus over these buildings. They're going China syndrome down into the earth. And we've covered that in episodes of the nuclear Fukushima meltdowns. You can look on my site, Beautiful Girl by Dana. So these buildings detonated. The discharges were dramatic. They threw the fuel rods. They threw the reactors themselves all over the site and it was dispersed into the environment all over Japan and so that's why we have to make this particular video and remember that that tsunami when it came through that's before as it's coming in then it's coming in it still went a hell of a lot higher than that 50 feet up so there was 9 million pounds on the ground in a common spent fuel pool that was swept away now the whole country of course was inundated by the tsunami now we'll get started and now we're going to do 20 minutes of the video today but once again like I told you my computer's been hacked and torn down and, and taken down nine different computers in the last year and a half and we've had um, the attack up on my site a, little, a few months ago where I had less than a few months ago where 30 of my videos were removed will the Japanese people really stand up one hour presentation on that uh, should Oxford University's taught by Wade Allison get recertified was taken down on me. These are one hour presentations. A uh, nuclear scientist like Kevin Kemper, human trash, was taken down. But I put the proof in the video. Fukushima Voodoo, Dr. Brian Hanley, that guy was whack job. He wrote a book. He's crazy. World's most disingenuous nuclear quack was taken down. Japan is broken, taken down disingenuous, evil PR firms. It's time for Japan to evacuate. They should go to Chernobyl. It's a hell of a lot less, less radiation in Chernobyl than it was in Japan. Fukushima nuclear PR firms, the evilest people on the earth. Well, that brings us to these guys coming up. And so, let's get started on that. We'll come over and make sure we're streaming Hunky Dory. And we'll start running into that 15 minutes into the stream. We got a 20 minute segment chopped out. The first seven minutes are the introduction. We're going to be interjecting into that. And then uh, Ken Buesler for 13 minutes. And then we should be at the end of our stream. The one hour stream should be over. It's 10 a.m. Uh, five days a week, Monday to Friday. And who knows what happens after. And it looks like the stream is going okay. <laughs> And so the pictures I showed you were the pre, before, and not that far before. Some of them could have been, but the majority of them weren't. And so it looks like I'm streaming okay. Everybody's fine. No one's yelling, Dana. You got no audio junk, stuff like that. Let's keep streaming. We're at Beautiful Girl by Dana. Fukushima, Japan, Radiation City, Cass, Most Despicable Betrayal. Part 1. And away we go. Okay. So, we have all size cars. Now, in order to set the stage, we're going to do a, court, a quick recap on yesterday. So, this is going to take a few minutes, four or five minutes to get through that. And we need that for context so everybody understands why I'm coming out and doing what I'm doing and why that's important and that they don't have any other narratives 
at these meetings that are actually PR firms and everybody that went up to the podium was part of the PR firm itself and this was scripted right out by the people with Jay Col or uh, Ken Busler and Asby Brown. So here we go with a quick introduction. Now Asby Brown talking about the, how the radiation coming out of the mountains blah, 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 and lakes and rivers and streams, how it finds its way down to the ocean where Ken is looking for it. I mean, that tells a hell of a lot, don't it? You would hope. Well, here we go. Keep in mind is that uh, cesium in its various chemical uh, compounds is water soluble. So it goes with the watershed. It goes where the water goes. And what we're seeing, is my, correct me? Almost. Uh, mm -hmm. On the freshwater side, it attaches to clay. Right. And so it's not as water soluble. That's why it's 80% coming down on particles, 20%. Mm -hmm. When it reaches the ocean, because of the high salt content, it becomes more soluble and ends up okay. being different. Strontium 90 that we've mentioned on both sides, salty and fresh, is very, moves with groundwater very readily, very low accumulation of sediments. Right. Um, but uh, uh, nevertheless, what is actually coming out of these river mouths into the ocean kind of is stuff that was deposited at one point Some in land. mountains, in forests and other parts of the land environment yeah. that gets into the watershed and then goes to rivers and creeks and lakes and ponds, et cetera, and eventually makes its way to the ocean. So Correct. this is the, the watershed is this important uh, transport system for, for the cesium. Yeah. Um, one brief question and then one other issue. Okay. So it's from the mountains to trees and everything and then it goes through all the watersheds and it finds its way down so it means all but rather than say that all that was contaminated by radiation let alone cesium uh, and that raises an interesting point that we'll get to after and i got set up so the next little tiny clip to keep this keep moving because we don't got a lot of time so we'll keep moving the next clip is we talk about how a long cesium will last. We know now that they just told you it's gone through all the rivers and lakes and estuaries and all the ecosystem itself. Yeah, and then Jay or Ken Bush was looking for it off the coastline. Very valuable, and I took an opportunity to meet him at a conference in Tokyo uh, shortly after that, and so we sort of stayed in touch. I guess another takeaway from today's talk was that um, this cesium is going to be very persistent in the offshore environment. Uh, certainly off of Fukushima, and we're talking about decades. We're talking about not five or ten years, we're talking about probably decades based on the half-life of the cesium. Very valuable, and I took an opportunity to... Decades. So that would mean that it's also on the land and in the streams and rivers and the banks and that soil and everything else for decades. Okay. Now, he's going to get asked a question. And how much radiation was in Tokyo water? Because like he told you, it's there for decades, right? And it's not going to turn to fury dust. Hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, speaking of land issues, I mean, basically, how safe is uh, Tokyo drinking water? Do you have any information about that? You might have more information on Tokyo drinking water. It's below those levels of 10, as far as I yeah. know. Well, um, I, I think uh, occasionally we find, again, the, Keeping in mind that the uh, detector systems they use are very, very sensitive. They can detect very, very minute mm -hmm. quantities. Mm -hmm. um, there is still some uh, cesium occasionally detected in the Tokyo area in these uh, in, in drinking water. Uh, of course, no iodine, 131, since uh, 2011. Uh, but they are in the 0 0.000 range uh, in terms of Becquerel's per liter. <laughs> zero point zero 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 Beckwells, but it's there for, for decades, and it was in all the lakes and rivers and streams and estuaries. Okay. Everybody, thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm Kyle Cleveland, the Associate Director of the Institute here of Contemporary Asian Studies at TUJ. Is this, is this coming through? Okay. Um, Tonight's event is probably about uh, the 10th or 12th event that we've done since 2011, somehow related to the Fukushima nuclear crisis. And, and, and Ken Busey was there about four of them. I think this is his fifth trip there. And what we tried to do is represent a lot of different perspectives, including the politics of the disaster. Well, you got him there half the time that everybody else was there. That's hardly representing. 
And uh, previously, we had done an event that was had in its title data-driven analysis of the Fukushima crisis. And I think... And I looked for that video. I couldn't find it. Maybe you can send me a link. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Obviously, one of the, uh, the nature of uh, nuclear events is that they tap into all sorts of uh, political ideologies and positions. And people have very strong feelings about this. And, um, and for good reason, because th this is very significant. And it possibly... Well, yes, it is. I'm glad you actually recognized that as being significant. And, of course, Dr. Raymond Gilmitty from Loveless Respiratory Research Institute in New Mexico done 94 peer-reviewed academic studies. One of them, of course, was on this one here. Or 94 of them was on beagle dogs and beagle puppies. And so what they showed was that the deaths from the radiation second line occurred from uh, 1.5 to 5.5 years, tumors of the lung, skeleton, livers. Now, this was 144 dogs, and bone tumors were in 93, lung tumors in 46, liver tumors in 20, blub, blurp, blurp. Because he's got 94 studies, right? I mean, 94 and 94, right? You know, you know, who's counting, right? Let's keep going. This public health and has profound social consequences. Uh, this evening's event, though, is unique in that we... Yeah, just remember, that's not uh, fruit flies we're talking about. That's beagle dogs and beagle puppies for, for 35 years. That's just one scientist. We have really one of the world's leading scientists who's dealt with radiological effects. Ken Bissler is a senior scientist at the Department of Maine Chemistry and Geochemistry at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, he specializes in the study of natural and man-made radionuclides in the ocean. His work includes studies of fallout from atmospheric nuclear weapons testing, assessments of Chernobyl impacts in the Black Sea, and examination of radionuclide contaminants in the Pacific resulting from the Fukushima accident. He has served as the chair of the Marine Chemistry and Geochemistry Department at, the, the, at his institute as the executive scientist at the U.S. Joint Global Ocean Flukes Planning and Data Management Office and two years as an associate program director at the U.S. National Science Foundation Chemical, Chemical Oceanography Program. In 2009, he was elected fellow of the American Geophysical Union, and in 2011, he was noted as the top-sided ocean scientist by the Times Higher Education of the Decade between 2000 and 2010. He was honored by the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science with their highest level fellowship award for overseas researchers who are Nobel laureates or recipients of similarly high-level international prizes. He is currently director of the Center for Marine and Environmental Radioactivity at the, at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and he reg regularly speaks on these issues. Um, and Dr. Raymond Gilmady got the 2000 Distinguished Scientific Achievement Award for killing beagle dogs and beagle puppies. So I think, you know, we should also you know, look at people like him, just, just saying. He has a flyer that we've passed around that you might look at, and you can get more information on his website. Okay, now let's listen to Jen, or Jen, Ken's, I like Jen, but let's listen to Ken's history from his own mouth after Fukushima, huh? Well, you know, just, just say, let's, let's keep it real. So... <laughs> Well, this event happened. I had actually moved out of this field. I was looking at radionuclides in the ocean, but more for climate studies, nutrients. But when we heard about the accidents, when I talked to some of the Japanese scientists, I'll show you some of the data, uh, we immediately knew we had to get there and find out independent confirmation. What are the levels? How bad was it? And this is just a picture of a ship from the University of Hawaii. We were very fortunate to find very quick funding this is in uh, June of 2011. Uh, typically, I plan cruises uh, two, three years ahead of time. So between the time when the uh, Moore Foundation came through with the funding and we were on the docks in Yokohama, it was about six weeks. Unbelievable. So, yeah, unbelievable. Unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable. So here he is. He came on board. He was off doing climbing scientists, looking at nutrients. Not what that speaker had just told you. Not that, you know, that he built it like Ken has been at this since 
Chernobyl. Chernobyl, one third size. Chernobyl, 30% meltdown. Chernobyl stopped after 10 days. Chernobyl was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. Chernobyl, you're using graphite. Chernobyl, they threw a million people at it. Chernobyl, they got a sarcophagus over it because the chain reaction stopped after 10 days. Chernobyl, there's over 1.5 million confirmed dead. Chernobyl, Kofi Annan in 2001 said there's over 3 million permanently disabled children. Chernobyl, they just opened the lakes in Switzerland after... Uh, 26 years, right? Two years ago. Thank you very much for your uh, very interesting information here. Um, I'm a Swiss national. My name is Andre Zimmerman. And um, I was, I've been living here already for a long time. But two years ago, the southern part of Switzerland finally allowed to actually fish again in the waters of the lakes there because of the Chernobyl incident. Now, that's a long time after the incident, and now coming back... Right, you still can't sell the meat or drink the milk in certain parts of UK, Ireland, and Scotland. They can't even sell the land there that was contaminated from Chernobyl. But the radiation never went to the drinking water in Tokyo. I only covered that yesterday, like you can't imagine. Let's get back and hit that stream again. Ken will speak for about 30 minutes, and thereafter, Asby Brown will be kind of a discussion and will facilitate a dialogue with Ken. Uh, as be yeah, we heard that kind of discussion. We covered that yesterday and a little bit there at the beginning of this video. Let's keep going. Uh, one of the uh, members of SafeCast, which is a citizen's radiation assessment organization. Uh, right, and we're supposed to be able to trust them. But you see what Asby Brown done yesterday and even in this video earlier, how he said 0 0.0000, just left it at that, like, and keep on going into the zeros. So we're going to cover that whole video over the next five days. And I know, you know, it's, that's very painful to do. Let's keep doing it. Then. Previously, Asby and Joe Morass, who's here with him, uh, gave a lecture on these issues uh, related to their particular organization. You can find that lecture online at, on the ICAS uh, YouTube channel. Uh, SafeCast is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, volunteer based organization that was created shortly after the Fukushima disaster to develop um, a very comprehensive testing and uh, assessment of radiation involving. Uh, a very comprehensive testing and evaluations and honesty and truthfulness and a citizen driven network. And instead, it got co opted by the nuclear industry. We're going to cover that for the next five days. Dana shows Volunteers up. and citizens to acquire this information. And even though they're an NGO that is non-government affiliated, they've been rare among such organizations to be able to make associations with some major organizations. They also had a presence at the International Atomic Energy Association meeting in Geneva. They had a presence at the International Atomic. <laughs> and on the other side is the nuclearproctologist.org. <laughs> These are not words you're going to hear any time in your lifetime. Vienna, um, I think last year. And uh, I think in the, the more recent International Atomic Energy Association report that was just recently published, they also are noted in that. And there's a short section that talks about their work. So Ken will speak first, and then Asby and him will have a dialogue, and then thereafter we'll open it up to a general discussion. So right now I'd like to welcome Ken Bissler. Yeah, his, his friends call him a Busler. It's, it's just an inside joke, right? Thank you. This microphone, someone's controlling the volume back there. Someone's controlling you back there. Great. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be here. I'll tell you why at the end of my talk, but... No, just tell us right now, dickhead. You're going to make me suffer through that nonsense? Who I am. Oh. I'm from this place, Woods Holographic Institution, W-H-O-I. Hooey! 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 It's a lot shorter and easier way to say where I'm from. 850-odd people who study all... Odd people. Scientists. And you can't find a nuclear scientist among them. they got to send out little butt, nuclear butt boy. Aspects of ocean sciences from the biology, chemistry, geology, physics, and engineering. Uh, I'm one of the rare ones there who studies marine radioactivity. I'm what's considered a radiochemist, a marine radiochemist. Uh, I'm going to try and take... Hang on. 
Well, this event happened. I had actually moved out of this field. I was looking at radionuclides in the ocean, but more for climate studies. Nutrient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the clip I was looking for. Let's keep going. It says from two sides of the Pacific, as we'll start kind of before and after what happened on this side in Japan. So we'll kind of review at a pretty basic level. I've been giving talks to public audiences. I'll try and make some parts simple, hopefully. Some parts might be a little confusing because they're going to cover a lot of... You see that picture he was showing you? That's the only picture he shows you the reactors from a satellite. Topics, but basically go from the events of March 11, 2011 to on the American side, what does that mean for our coastline in terms of the transport with ocean currents of radioactivity from Japan across the Pacific? Hang on, did he just admit there was current? Did he just say the ocean currents? That sounds like some serious conspiracy theory shit to me, dear Busler. I don't believe you. I've been saying that now for about a year and a half, and everybody attacks me for saying the currents are real. And here you are, you get your way with it. At a university, that's actually a PR firm for the nuclear industry. Let me run over and make sure everything looks hunky-dory. We're 30 minutes into the screaming match. Dun, 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 dun. Hi, Miss Milky. Jan Brooks. You'll find Jan's links below. Jan's links below. I suppose it'll light up. Jan never stops. She never stops. Just she's, she's on everything out there. Anything that shows up with Japan or radiation or these people, she finds it and puts it up on her site. And we get to go drool sometimes. So hi, everybody. Everything's looking good. Sweet. Where's Toilet? Shawnee can. Rattle Shark. Albert. Let's keep going. We're happening. Boom, 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 boom. Where was I? Oh, you didn't see that, did you? You'll survive. I just want to check to make sure everybody was hunky dory. Let's boogly woogly ugly. I'll show our predictions. I'll show some data. I'll talk a lot about, at the end, public education. That's one reason I'm passing this around, is we're trying to reach audiences with some simple messages about radioactivity to understand there was cesium in the ocean before Fukushima, how much more was added after Fukushima, at what level should we be concerned, that type of thing. Uh, so we're doing well, a single atom will give you a cancer. It might take 5, 10, 15, 20 years to manifest, but a single atom will give you a cancer. A lot of that, and then I'll end with a little plug for devices to make it easier. Actually, I'm inspired. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hang on. Just bear with me. Just bear with me. Get rid of that. I got something here. I got something. Ooh. Just struck me. I can't remember. Hang on. I'll find it. Hang on. I'll go look for where you guys are watching this. Okay, here it is. This was one of uh, Dr. Raymond Gilmetti's studies. Let me make sure I'm streaming. Yeah. Curium. 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 Curium isotopes. Why is that important, Dana? Well, he, he, he was killing dogs with curium. But where does curium or what? Isotope is the most isotope if it's reprocessed, reclaim uranium, reclaim plutonium from the spent fuel rods and put through a chain reaction again, like it was in Japan. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, well, if you use the rods, although little use is currently, now that was 1989, yeah, 1989. He was killing these beagle dogs way back then. Although little use is currently being made of purified CM sources, that's curium. And such uses is possible if reprocessing of spent fuel becomes feasible. Well, Japan worked that one out. Because little information is available in the biokinetics, blah, blah, blah. But the majority, right? So curium isotopes are a major byproduct in an irradiated nuclear reactor fuel and comprises a significant fraction of the alpha emitting radionuclearides inventory. Do you got any? Oh, we'll work on this later. 
it just struck me for some reason. I had to go. I'm doing a live stream, but I still had to go look at that. That is extremely significant. Let's get back. Settle down. We got uh, 25 minutes to go. Dana stops jumping in all the time. Dana. Here we go. A lot by SafeCast because they can all carry the little Geiger counters around and collect data. We're doing a bit of that the hard way, and we're going to try and make it easy for people to wear a device that would allow you to actually... <laughs> <laughs> so Ken, what Ken is coming up with a CC one thirty seven device for everybody to wear? <laughs> Some more of that one later. <laughs> like a sample for cesium uh, isotopes. So my background. This is from nineteen eighty six. But the majority of it would have been curium. See, yeah, not cesium, but what we just seen just now. If my math was right. And I bet you we'll find out in the next couple of days, so I'll look it all up. Remember, the year of Chernobyl, that was the year of that accident. I had studied a uh, plutonium isotopes in the North Atlantic. The origin of that plutonium was the weapons testing that was conducted globally, mostly in the late 50s, early 60s. Right, and so Chernobyl stopped after 10 days, but Chernobyl was equal to 400 weapon tests, yeah, in 10 days. And so Chir uh, Fukushima didn't stop. Fukushima is three times the size each reactor. And there's three of them, 100% meltdown, melt-throughs, and melt-outs. And so, like, Chernobyl's a candlestick. Let's keep going, though, anyway. Uh, I stayed at Woods Hole uh, because of Chernobyl, which led to some of my first publications. I hadn't planned on this, of course. No one did. But there was a lot of interest in the Black Sea ongoing studies. The Europeans were kind of looking to the north, the Baltic Seas were the closest to the north, the Black Sea to the south, that were impacted by these events. And so we spent... Right, because but Chernobyl only lasted 10 days, but Ken spent years there studying the radioactive folly, but he can't find anything off Japan. The worst disaster on the planet has been played down constantly, continuously, and then manipulated by the PR firms at Temple University, Asby, Brown, Ken Beersler, and the rest of them. I, I would say there's a big connection <laughs> there somewhere. Kind of like... Woods Hole, maybe, yeah. If you don't understand Woods Hole, let's just boom, boom, that for one second. Oh, to be Woods Hole. So if you go to Woods Hole and you start and you start looking for the connections, let's go way back. So Woods Hole is there in the center, and then you got. All these people that go, there's 850 permanent scientists here, and lots of nuclear, but you'll never hear from them, you'll only hear from Ken, marine chemist, not a, not a marine biologist, but a marine chemist, right? But as you start looking at how they spread out, you'll find Azzy Brown and Temple University's connotations in here, I can assure you as you keep going through that, and there's around 50 pages of this all together that's been sourced out uh, per se, right? When, who knows if we actually got them all. Let's keep going anyway. But it's important to understand that uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution were the people who said uh, Corex, the 3 million plus gallons dumped in the Gulf of Mexico after the BP spill, uh, was harmless. And they were the same people that said after 911, all that dust throughout the city was harmless. We know better now, of course. That was Woods Hole. So Woods Hole, this is what I'm saying. To, they roll them out every time there's an event. And that's what they're doing right now at Temple University, Japan's college in Japan. Uh, close to 10 years, I've been back a couple times since then, looking at the fate of that material in the Black Sea to the south. <clears throat> the, I kind of left that field almost completely in terms of artificial human-made radionuclides and do a lot of work related to the ocean's role in climate and controls of carbon and nutrients. And for that, I use naturally occurring radionuclides, uranium and thorium. But when Fukushima Daiichi happened, we knew... Right, natural, like uranium and thorium, natural uranium. But if you put it through a chain reaction, it accepts extra electrons, and now it's not natural no more. That's the stuff we're talking about. Not the natural stuff. <laughs> had to be a response. We should try and get there as soon as we can and do something. Uh, I actually came to Tokyo in late May of 2011, with a research ship that we sent from Hawaii that was loaded with gear and people and sampling equipment to do some of our first assessments kind of further offshore than where the Japan had been focused and back in. 
right and remember at the beginning of the video I showed you a detailed map of the Canadian coastline that Dana and the Hounds of Fukushima spent 260 days doing and documenting and posting those pictures at the nuclear proctologist.org with context at the bottom of each of those pages. Here we go. Uh, this is just a cartoon. I don't want to go over the series of events, the overheating and the explosion. I'm sure people are familiar with the general half goings on, but basically... No, can't tell us. Show everybody just one friggin' time in your life what these buildings look like before you do one of these presentations. How hard could that be for, for Ken to put up four lousy pictures and say, that's unit one, that's three times the size of Chernobyl, that's 100% melt through, melt out, Chernobyl's one third meltdown, or 30% meltdown, 30% the size, that's unit two, that's unit three and four, as you can see they're fine, right? And so we're not worried about any releases into the ocean. How come Ken can't do something like that? Oh, I know, because people get up and walk out. There's really two sources of radionuclides to the ocean. These contaminants came. Uh, first off was the overheating that led to the explosions and then the atmospheric release. So fallout. Is the <laughs> the atmospheric release. <laughs> there are two sources, yeah? Oh, okay. Here we go. Keep going, Dana. Generically called. And that peaked only a few days after March 11th. So this was something that was... Right, and Chernobyl peaked a few days too, but they're still at it down there, dummy. Peaking in mid-March of 2011. Direct discharge, that would be any source from water. Over like, you know, if a terrorist explodes a bomb in your city, is it safe to go back the next day because the biggest part went through the day before? No. Can you go back in a thousand years because the biggest part went out the first day? No. And if the groundwater is coming from that plant and they were peaking in 2011 in early April, I'll show you a plot uh, of that. And yeah, I'm peeking right now. I'll show you a plot. That ever gets me hands Both on you. Of these. This one basically has stopped. There's still some direct discharge from that site. What's ongoing? Still some discharge. And some of the reasons we keep coming back and working with the Japanese is looking at the continued transport from land. Well, why wouldn't you go back? You went back to Chernobyl. You stayed down there forever. Why wouldn't you go back to Japan? What do you mean for some reason we went back to Japan? The ocean. So that would be through rivers or through underground water flow, ground water flow, and both of these are much smaller than what happened in 2011. I'll show some data on that. And realize that most of the winds blew things out into the ocean, so about 80% of the fallout went into the ocean, most of it close to Japan, some of it in the far field in Woods Hole where I live outside of Boston. Ten days after the first explosions, we could detect it in the atmosphere, that type of thing. Uh, so there was a... Yeah, okay, hang on. You, it was all detect, did you? Oh, yeah, you didn't bother telling anybody about that. You, you, how convenient now, you, now you're mentioning it. Okay, hang on then. Do, 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 do. Hang on. Shoo, what's all, what's all, what's all, models, models, models. Um, that's not the one I was looking for at all. 20 million particles of radioactive iodine fell on Woods Hole, buddy. Per liter, per liter. Uh, was, and the 132 was 10 times higher in northern Japan. Do you admit it? Plus, uh, 132 is nine times more effective at ionizing radiating the thyroid gland. The gland can die, see? But 133, there was 10 times, 30 times more of that. And then 129 had a 15.7 million year half-life. There was a study with 31 times more of that. So when you look at this headline, you see 131, 20 million a liter. A million, that's 20 million cancers. There was all those other active isotopes. Plus, the reactors were in uranium plutonium, not that. Let's keep going anyway on that video. I'll look for that while we're watching that. But Rapid global transport of atmospheric deposits, but mostly localized because of the pattern. Mostly localized. This was Noah's model based upon just a couple of days releases from a single reactor, not from three and four, but only from unit one, just for a couple of days. It wasn't based upon the melted reactor itself or the spent fuel pools disappearing, but just a fire in the spent fuel pool and... Uh, what he called there was a release of emissions. 
Uh, but I mean, look what that done. That's just a 40 day model. And can it can it spin on it, right? Fall out. And then this direct discharge is what's moving across with ocean currents. So that's just the general state. He done it again. He said the currents are real. Probably the best day of my whole life. Ground where we are at. Uh, I do want to cover quickly, and it's also in this flyer, you know, how big was it? And it is kind of frustrating four and a half years later because as we measure the total quantities, and I'm going to just mostly focus on cesium isotopes, 137 here, and measurement. Well, just realize that each reactor had 3,450 assemblies. Each assembly had 80 rods. Each rod was 18 pounds and 12 feet, or, uh, yeah, and 12 feet long. And that's 5 million pounds per reactor. The common spent fuel pool that they never mentioned was on the ground, had 9 million pounds in it. The Becquerel, which I often have to explain, it's a very odd unit. You know, radioactivity, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, you can't see it, you can't feel it. So we measure how many decay events there are per second. Can't pick it up, can't throw rocks at it. In a given sample. In this case, we're adding up these sources, nuclear weapons testing, a thousand petabecquerels, a one with 15 zeros, that's the amount. So nuclear testing. Fukushima is equal to all the nuclear testing every week, if not every day. Our numbers are shown in comparison to Chernobyl, Fukushima is equal to about 1,080 Hiroshima bombs with the radiation going into the Pacific Ocean today. That's on the Chernobyl model, but Chernobyl was based upon graphite, not to reclaim uranium plutonium that was throughout the Fukushima Daiichi's reactors. Very small unit. It's like measuring distance in millimeters in a way. So a Becquerel is not a large amount relative to, I'll show you some health effects and things, but we can easily detect it. I can measure fractions of a Becquerel in seawater. Yeah, and so can other people. Uh, your video has been removed. Woods Hole claims 137 turns into potassium 40. Bananas. Hang on. Woods Hole, just when you see that, claims. Now, that video was taken down a few months ago. This was about, he's claiming cesium 137. He's going to do that a lot in this video. This is about 1,000, Chernobyl's about 85, I'd say round numbers, it's about 10 times less. We tried to indicate here by above and below the water line, that was basically a land-based accident, uh, far from the oceans, most of it fell on land in Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union. But that's why he was studying the Black Sea, right? The rest of Europe in general. Global nuclear weapons testing was distributed worldwide, so it's basically two-thirds in the ocean, one-third on land. And then here's Fukushima Daiichi with atmospheric and those direct inputs and these ranges, because we still, to this day, most of it got in the ocean, wasn't a lot of sampling. Okay. We've got to cover that part. Uh -huh. YouTube. So, nuclear waste, nuclear workers, nu nuclear, nuclear models from different countries. Let's go back one first. Models. Oh, yeah. So, this model, I'll make sure I'm streaming that. Yeah. So, this model is just a, a few releases. These, these are not going in the ocean, Jay. They're washing back down from the mountains to the coastline, Jay. And that's why all the species were missing. But this is only over a couple of days releases. Just a couple of days. This was North America cesium-137 dispersal. And this was a, uh, I think this was a Japanese institution. And so that's North America. That's the cesium-137 coming into North America, covering North America and Canada. This Canada up above it. And you can see... These are only based upon a single release from a single reactor for a very short period of time. But if you look at the models from different countries, right, the forecast by the, the Austria Central Institute for Meteorology and Geodynamics, ZAMGI, uh, that's March the 15th. You had Norwegian Institute for Air Research done a Model J. You never bothered showing anybody, or J. Ken. You never bothered showing anybody. I just showed you that one, right? That was um, 
Norwegian Institute for Air. This one was by uh, Eurads, that the Rice Institute for European Research at the University of Cologne showed a forecast altitude radiation cloud concentrating over California, April 11th. That was that one there. I never looked at that one. Well, maybe later, but the CC 137 plume forecast that was done by France Institute for Radiological Protection and Nuclear Safety. Right, these are all institutions. And then they ended, the, Nor the Norwegian Institute, it ended uh, as a large radiation cloud was over the U.S. and Canada. Meanwhile, let's go back to uh, Ken Busler. Uh, Busler. <laughs> sure, but we have a range kind of in this 10, 15 at the low end for both sources up to maybe 60, I've seen 80. You know, I kind of say they're comparable. It's certainly smaller. I wouldn't put a number on saying it's 20%. Well, each of the reactors in Japan are three times the size as Chernobyl. Each of them had much more fuel, much different, more maniacal types of fuel. Each of them were 100% meltdowns. Chernobyl was a 30% meltdown. Chernobyl stopped after 10 days, but Chernobyl was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. Ch Fukushima is equal to all the, re all the bomb testing throughout history in a week. It depends on the isotope. This is one specific isotope. But there's certainly much more... Right, and there's a couple of thousand... And there's 90 times more strontium for every cesium that he talks about. 90, strontium 90, it acts like calcium goes into your bones and your pelvis and creates mutated stem cells. Let's keep going. It was an unprecedented event for the ocean in terms of the amount of radioactivity that was put into the ocean from Fukushima compared to Chernobyl. Right, and the Fukushima expeditions for life. You need to go look at that stuff up at the nuclearproctologist.org or watch the beginning of this video later and you'll see that how bad it was really truly for the ocean. Let's keep going. And for U.S. audiences, the other meltdown that happened Three Mile Island is just trivial and insignificant relative to these other extreme accidents. My job as a radiochemist... What? Wait, what? That's what I mean, right? You just... Like, it might take seven or eight days to do this video because that guy is just... Every sentence is questionable often complicated because of these naturally occurring compounds that enter the ocean through weather. Look, the Geiger counter is not going to pick up bananas, potato chips, and walking in the sunshine and getting on airplanes. But if you were actually trying to find the radioactive isotopes from a reactor, you can tell the isotope came from Korea or came from Pakistan or Russia. You guys know all of that. So he's muddling the water with that statement. Uranium-238, potassium My Geiger counter can't pick that stuff up, and neither can yours. ...in the ocean. And in those same units, they're much, much bigger. And when I'm measuring decay events, I have to separate out some of the background radioactivity from the smaller amounts of cesium. So even though these seem like a huge number, when you compare them to what's already in the ocean from natural sources, these are still small amounts. Not to trivialize these numbers. Now, see... He's looking for natural, for many years, he was looking for natural radioactive isotopes that are harmless, that couldn't mutate a fruit fly, that has no use for chain reaction, that has nothing to do with that. And he's taking that dialogue and he's putting it in this conversation. And because they only have that particular problem when they're trying to find something besides potassium and the natural uranium that's in the ocean, it's such a low, nut, low uh, stuff they're trying to isolate and see if they can find a new one to add into this table to confuse everybody. And then now he's married that into nuclear conversation. But realize that's a challenge. That's something we live with, and that's something uh, we have to consider in my business and I think in talking to public audiences. So both natural sources and these additional human-made sources of radioactivity. Look, you know, you see people getting tested with these Geiger counters to see if they got radioactive material on them, right? That, that's not going to pick up the natural potassium in, that, in their body or the natural polonium-210 or something like that. They're not worried about that. When they, get, when they get a hit, they say, okay, that's radiation. So what Ken is doing to you is he's playing this game that he's marrying, looking for natural radioactive isotope as a research because that doesn't emit anything, so it's very difficult to find it and identify it. And there's about 262 of the natural ones they identified, but none of them 
can give you cancer. None of them can harm you. None of them can mutate a fruit fly. But everything out of Japan can mutate a fruit fly. And everything out of Japan can do the studies that Dr. Raymond Gilmedy, right? You know, we're 144 dogs. They got annihilated. Let's keep going with the video. So how much? Uh, in terms of water levels? I'm going to measure becquerels now, but for... So the cesium, the, the, the red ones you're looking at, the red dots, they're 134. They got a two point something year half-life times 10. So 20 year half-life. Let's keep going. Cubic meter of water. This can be confusing. And unfortunately for this talk, I do have some that are per liter, a much smaller volume. Uh, we use this in oceanography because before Fukushima Daiichi, the number off Japan was about two becquerels in a cubic meter of water. <clears throat> so a cubic meter of water is a thousand liters. Cubic meter of water is a thousand liters. Just let me show you something. Now in Canada, they, train, they, they changed the drinking water standard. And look what a liter has, 7,000 becquerels of artificial tritium. This is from a chain reaction of 3H. And so that's 7 million in a cubic meter that he's talking about, he doesn't bother to mention. He's talking about the cesium is 10 becquerels a liter. It's 10,000 in a cubic meter. But tritium has 7 million in the Canadian drinking water standards. They didn't ever bother explaining. But uranium throughout history is only 0 0.2 milligrams. Not becquerels, but milligrams because it's not radioactive. The lead is incredibly tiny. Radioactivities is 0 0.02 becquerels a liter. And natural uranium throughout history is only 0.5. But all these man-made ones are huge numbers. They've been introduced. These are all carcinogens. You get Every time you drink it, you get more in your body and it stays there. And every day you got extra. And next day you got more. The day after you got more, etc., etc., etc. That's very important because that doesn't happen with potassium or uranium or radon or anything like that. The highest levels we saw after Chernobyl were up to about 1,000. This is logarithmic scale. Each red dot is an ocean sample collected and analyzed by TEPCO very close in the ocean to that harbor, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plants. And so these are numbers that are being collected. When I saw this data, downloading PDFs every day, looking at it, it became worrisomely high. These are levels that certainly unprecedented in my experience, and you can predict possible effects directly on marine biota swimming in those waters. What this was is some of the cooling water that's being applied heroically and necessarily, but getting into the ocean because of leaks and buildings and cracks. And you might remember some of the news, but there was heroically. They sprayed salt water on it, which created the sulfur peroxide hydrogen buckyball that ingested the atoms and turned them into little nuclear engines. It's a, it's a phenomenon you knew about in the 40s and 50s from uh, ocean testing with nuclear weapons. Really bad stuff. The water they're spraying on the reactors is a desperation, desperate move. That's all it is. They gave them up hope. You won't see Ken in there and saying, yeah, that looks pretty good. Maybe you want to tilt it a little bit this way or that way. You won't see Harvard or Yale or Berkeley or MIT or Stanford or Temple University or Asby Brown or Ken Abusel or anybody else going in there. No, no, they'll sit a distance and try to mock it or try to misrepresent every aspect of it and confuse everybody with this highly, highly scripted talk that they're doing that we're covering and dinner, keep going. We only got a few minutes left, so. Things like a gusher of water coming out that had to be stopped. You plug the hole and what happens is a level. You, okay, we'll, we'll stop there and we'll pick up there tomorrow. You plug the hole, you plug the hole. You plug that hole, yeah? Is that right? How did you, I don't know, you know, plug the hole. <laughs> yeah, we plugged the hole, Dana. That's why he didn't show you pictures at the beginning, because everybody would get up and walk out. I'm not going to bore you with pictures, he says. No, because nobody can find an actual picture unless they come find me. Proper pictures. Like, it's shocking. I spent months originally. We gathered up 5,000 pictures finally, but we spent months trying to identify each of the reactors. And I give them to you here in a nice short package. Okay, we'll call it a day. So the first one was we knew it was going to be a bit slow, and so whatever. Uh, and so part two is the moral, 10 a.m. Pacific Canada time, British Columbia time. 
and you know we usually get we usually get a say a thousand comments in the comment section during these streams make sure I'm actually streaming and we'll come over and say hi to everybody and good day to everybody as we call it a day and so we set a compelling case for our first kick at the can I think so for episode one we showed right away at the beginning of the video the damage to the entire coastline of Canada in just a simple handful of videos that I think tells a lot and that leaves me still haunted every night and drives me every morning to do the things I'm doing and you know how much work does it take for me to get ready for each of these videos and to know where everything is to and be able to find it the way I do and to have everything incorporated into into the software and you, and I'm doing this with a free version because the the thousand dollar version and that computer itself is down and I still refuse to stop and I think that I'm able to still present it properly and I don't have any regrets about the video or my antiques and so you plug the hole with Ken and <laughs> show you will. <laughs> Good call. Rattle Shark. Gary. Yeah. Yeah, Gary said it. There you go. So if it's so safe, Ken and Jay and Asby and all them should go down and have a little square dance, have a little barbecue, oh, bring the kitties. <coughs> yeah, you're too late, touch you. Miss Milky. Sends out the well wishes to have a good day everybody Jan's got lots of material on her site so there's lots of links below you'll find her and you'll find Kay, um, Kate from the Fukushima Hounds it's an independent website and you say hi to Candace and everybody just cruising <laughs> it won't, requires a shovel won't melt on the sun we have no technology but we could build it we, we have 45 or 4340 peer review academic stu studies published every day in the North American universities and we were to get to work on some of these equations today 47 40 say 4,000 peer review studies going to work on how to, to build a containment unit to deal with some of this stuff tomorrow another 4700 on how to fund those containment units to the day after another 4700 peer review studies on how to flush the water repeatedly and try to contain whatever was left and you know the next day 4700 peer review studies within a month I think the whole planet would feel better you know 4700 peer review studies on how to create food that is beneficial but doesn't accumulate radiation and how to uh, deal with the radiation that is there and how to mitigate it in water and food sort of for the populations and the animals and the insects Terry Ann, Kate, Patrick, thanks everybody. Freak, Bob, Jimmy, Tree, Gary, Sylvia, Matt, Coffee Enema, there you go, Jimmy Joes, uh, John, Adam, Er, and everybody else. Elaine is out there, Amthors, Mickey, we got all kinds of people I'm not going to get to mad everybody and so you know we're justified in what we're doing they have to lie they have to script they have to bring in people to ask the questions and the questions are designed to confuse and to uh, distort the entire process safe cas has now gonna have to deal with this guy and the people that he supplied He's, they're going to have to deal with him if they want any credibility. This whole week we're going to flush that out and push back against this enslavement and that these people are, are cowards. They are the lowest forms of life imaginable and they got a job to deceive and manipulate everybody. They got a job to do that. They know exactly what they're doing. They scripted it out to try to fool you and that the only blowback will ever come their way, it will be us. 
wouldn't have, you know, if we, if we didn't do what we're doing right now, there'd be no blowback on them whatsoever, and they'd be getting big fat paychecks, and they'd be very proud of themselves, and their families, their friends, their loved ones, their relatives, their students wouldn't know that these people are maniacal, lying, mass murderer and sacks of doodoo because nobody gets to hear another narrative and they scripted their narrative out and as we go through the next few days that's going to become blatantly um, aware of that and that each of these episodes is so much more than them you learn so much in such a short time and I provide it all in real time I don't hide anything away from you I don't make the typical mistakes because I've been down at this for so long and I have such a, a, a huge archive of all of this material that we can challenge everything they're saying because it's all lies and we have the proof. And I will flush that out if given a chance. And so hugs for everybody. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. I think it was a really good stream myself. And I think that, you know, when I get the TriCaster... If anybody's not familiar with what that is, just before we take off, we'll just do a few puns on the TriCaster. Because right now we're using crap gear, but we're raising money, and you'll find links below my video at Beautiful Girl by Dana to donate. You can donate at the Nuclear Proctologist with your credit cards. And we got to raise another uh, close to $30,000 to complete this. We got one tenth of it raised in the last week or so. And, you know, it's, it's uh, difficult to always ask. But we, we need to do that. We need this equipment to be able to create the media, to break through the paradigms and to have an authentic, proper outfit. And this is so much more than I can even explain in a short few minutes. But you can also donate at thenuclearproctologist.org and you can donate at PayPal. You'll find links below. Uh, you type in my email at PayPal, danadurnford.hotmail.com. And so... You know, that's, that's the sad part is Jake, uh, Ken Buesler raised $5 million right away to go down off of Japan and he raised millions and millions and millions and millions ever since. And the opposition has nothing. And so I have to come out and ask for money. I have to come out and beg for money. I don't have any operating costs. I don't, we don't raise any money. We started raising money for this. But I mean, how can I get better? How can I have a, you know, a more compelling show in a more compelling stance to be able to do things without raising money and so at some point when I do get my break it's over for them because we'll have what it takes to bring these people to their knees and as you can see with just one stream we, we took their credibility and wrecked it their credibility is gone permanently but we'll continue for the rest of the week hugs for everybody thanks everybody We'll see you again tomorrow, 10 a.m. Pacific Canada time, British Columbia uh, time, at Beautiful Girl by Dana on YouTube. Take care, folks.